Hello everyone, welcome to this Unity with the best talk. Our subject, our subject is shaders, what they are, what we can do with them, how to make custom ones, and also an introduction to physically based shader development in Unity. I am Claudia Slash, I'm a game developer and a functional programmer, but today we're focusing on the game development part. I'm talking about shaders because I've been the shader programmer for Cybercook, which is a hyper-realistic 3D cooking game. As you can see from the screenshot, even though it was on iPad and Gear VR, we had a lot of fun with it. There is subsurface scattering, cook torrents, BRDF, and other, another few BRDFs, which are pretty interesting. So we're going to talk about most of that later on. I also write shadercut.com, where I'm going to post references and slides for this talk, and where I plan to write about more shaders, especially in Unity, and some Rust too. So my introduction done, let's start. The question is, why bother making your own custom shader system? After all, Unity 5 standard shader system is pretty good, as you can see from this Ghost of a Tail screenshot post the upgrade to Unity 5. But with it, you can't make journey. If you use the standard shader, your games will look the same as everybody else. You can achieve an amazing looking game, which will stand out from the rest, which probably, for good or for worse, is what a game needs on the market th these days. And if you have control of the custom shader system, you can also optimize for a specific target platform more easily, like if you need to have a VR version, where you will most likely need to have much many more FPS, it's good to be able to tone down the shaders in order to get those FPS more easily. Uh, there are also drawbacks to making your own custom lighting shader system. Uh, one is that it is more work and it has a cost in terms of time and also the time you spend to think about it. And also you need feedback from the artists which what is good about it and what is bad. And you will probably need to read those GDC and SIGGRAPH graphics paper. But we chose our objective, so let's look at how to achieve it. First, a quick overview of what a shader actually is. In my own words, a shader is a piece of code that runs on the GPU, takes vertices, textures, and other data, and returns pixel colors. It's a very simplified definition, but I think it does get the point across, and also it fits in one slide. So we have the scene, and the scene is made of many objects, textures, shaders, and much more. But out of some of those, some objects have the same material, so you can get them in the same draw call, which will be a list of vertices, texture, data, and you know, shaders, or other information, which are passed to the vertex shader, which will execute on every vertex, it will give you interpolated information and data to pass to the fragment shader, which is where our lighting is happening, and that will give you the final pixel color. Um, this was uh, a forward render, but there are a few types of renders, so I'm going to show them to you quickly. So we said forward, then the further is forward plus, and then object space, which is very new and interesting, and they just presented it a GDC, so you should take a look at that as well. So a forward uh, renderer. In forward rendering, we raster each geometric object in the scene and light and shade it at a rasterization time. That entails doing a light pass for each light for every object. So if you have many lights, this gets expensive really fast. But you can do quite complex lighting with it, and Unity supports this mode. So it's one of the ones we can choose. Also, there is uh, the third renderer, by which first rasterizes the objects into to the image buffers, which include the information it will need later on to do a lighting pass. It's way cheaper when you have many lights, but it is limited by the buffer size. So you have to choose which information to include and which information to discard, which then limits what lighting you can achieve with those information. Also, it doesn't work with transparent objects, so you still need uh, some forward rendering to get transparent objects to render. And it's quite, it's bad with aliasing. It's got higher setup costs, but it scales up better. So 
we do need to your choice is either forward or deferred, and in this talk, we'd always use forward. So how does this work in practice within Unity? Each material has a side shader assigned, as you can see here, custom plane surface shader. And the shader is written in CG, which is a cross-platform language invented by NVIDIA, but you can also use the Shader Lab ex Unity extension. You can create a new shader, and when you do, it give, Unity gives you some pre-filled templates. So you can choose between a surface shader, which is a shader that uses Shader Lab, or other types, which we're not really interested in at this time. So what surface shaders give you, even though they don't fall on the usual vertex and pixel shaders, so they work slightly different, but we'll show you that. So they, what they give you is easy normal mapping, many helper functions, and also automatic add passes for the forward render, so you don't have to do that by hand, but occasionally they are in the way. For example, if they the automatic things they do, if they do it in a way that doesn't work with your requirements, you'll have to do it yourself anyway and go down to the CG shading level. How to write a surface shader? So they are made of various blocks. The first one is properties. They are our inputs and we can fill them out in the inspector. And we can also build custom inspector editors like the one for the standard shader. Uh, the code of which is available, and I'll show you later where to find it. Then we have the subshaders, where we set the properties like cal, Z-Fright, Fog, also the render type and the pragmas, and we set up the variables from the property above, and we also declare our functions and intermediate structs. Now, the intermediate structs are very important. They are the vessels which carry the data between the output and the input of every phase. So if you, for the, from the vertex, to pass data from the vertex shader to the surface function to the fragment shader, you need those tracks. They have limited slots, so uh, you have to choose carefully which things, which data you include in them. And they are the only way to get data across the phases I said before. Uh, this is the surface function. It's slightly magical, and that's uh, a bit that's included in Shader Lab. So it's got uh, some extra functions like unpack normal. But basically, what you do in it, as you can see, you have an input struct and an output struct, and you in the input struct you get the texture coordinates for your textures and other things. So you can uh, look up your textures in this phase and fill the surface output custom with that data. And you can also do some calculations if you need to. And from there, um, the output of that is passed into the custom lighting function. Now, Unity has a default uh, lighting functions, which you can use, as you can see in the pragma here, you can choose a, a Lambert, for example. But if you want a custom one, you need to follow the naming convention, which is to call it something, and then when you declare the function, you call it lighting, and then whatever you called it before. As you can see, the lighting function returns a fixed for, which is a color, and it takes the surface output struct, which we were supposed to define earlier, and light direction, view direction, and that. And there are a couple of variations on this, but they look pretty much similar. An optional thing is to have a custom vertex shader. Now you wouldn't normally need that, but there are some calculations we can be cheaper to do in the vertex shader and will still be accurate enough, or there are some data that you can only access in the vertex shader, so you need to save that in a struct and pass it on. So that's why you would have a custom vertex shader. The standard vertex shader, which we're looking at, is included in the standard shader implementation file, which I'm going to show you how to download here. So this is the version downloader uh, on the Unity website. And in the drop down, you can see of each version, there is a built-in shaders field. And that gives you all the files for the shader implementation, and also includes many so G include file, which we will need to hook into the shadows and the light maps and the global illumination that Unity gives you. 
Uh, now let's talk a bit about what shaders used to look like before physically based shading appeared back in 2010 or so. In the older days, you, there were only a few features a shader lighting system could have. You could have a diffuse, a specular, a normal, you could have a pre-calculated BRDF uh, in, within a lookup texture, and you could have Fresnel, which wasn't at all what it what it is now, what we, which we now intend with Fresnel. And this is because we lack the computational power to do complex lighting at runtime. So basically the artists had to invent and make stuff up that still looked good, even though we weren't using any mathematically sound way to do this. So the old way to do the diffuse, according to a bare bones version of the microfacet theory, the light is being reflected equally in all directions. A very common way to calculate that was using the dot product of the normal and the light directions. But there's nothing stopping it from giving back more light that it receives, which is bad. And this is the standard Unity Shader implementation in those lighting.cg include files. Uh, as you can see, it's still dot normal and light, and then it multiplies that with the light color and the diffuse texture and returns a color. Normal mapping is still largely the same today, and it's a cheap way to add geometry with that detail without adding geometry. The specular. Um, the specular at the time, the smoother a surface was, the less it scatters light away in random directions. So it just focuses it in a specular highlight. We used to use specular power, but it doesn't include a re um, realistic model of roughness, which is a concept we'll touch on in a bit. So it was quite imprecise and made up basically. Now we'll go on to look at the most important principle of physically based shading and what they had, to, what we just saw was the old way of doing things. So first, the lighting needs to be in linear space. Now this is a funny one. For decades we've done our lighting calculations in gamma space, which is what screens use, and we never notice it's not correct, or maybe we didn't care, I'm not sure. But because gamma space follows this curve, you can see in the image, calculation will have incorrect result. They will be slightly off, not terribly off, but it's still enough to give it that typically last decade sort of game look. Basically, dark colors are overrepresented, which is good for screens because our eyes are more sensitive to dark colors, but it's really bad for our math. And as, is, as it is often the case in graphics, the error is not obvious. It's just off in subtle, annoying ways. And as you can see in this image, the middle point of the grays from linear to gamma is very different. If you want to use linear on Unity, if you're not on, if you are on PC, that's okay. That's easy. You just check this setting in your build settings. But if you are on mobile, you have to do that in your shaders. So every time you uh, sample a texture or every time you get a color, you'll have to multiply, get them to the power of 2.2. And then at the very end of your scene rendering, you'll need to have a full screen effect, which will put the final color back to gamma. So it, it, we have to, what power, it, it's to the power of one divided by 2.2. This process, it, it looks very simple, but it, it leads to very interesting conversation with artists and everyone ends up confused. So it looks simple, but watch out for it. Then HDR. Our light, the light values in the real world are not limited to 64-bit integers. And this is where HDR comes in. It's a way to represent very bright values and very dark values. In Unity, the, it's easy enough to turn it on on the camera component. There is a checkbox, but you should watch out to check that all your cameras have got HDR on, because if you have some the odd camera which has it off, it's can create hard to track strange things. Uh, once you have an HDR camera, then you need to worry about tone mapping to get those that high dynamic range back to a range you can actually show on a screen. Uh, 
luckily the research that's already been done for cinematography can be recycled and I suggest you take a look at the filmicgames.com website for many examples of tone mapping operators you can use. This is the scary rendering of our equation. The rendering equation is basically what we're trying to solve in real time in less than 12 milliseconds. You will find it around in many different formulations with many different letters representing the same things, which makes it all the more confusing. But very basically, some light hits the objects from some direction and we integrate all bounces in direct light and taking into consideration the light that was absorbed or lost so that we have less that we received at the end. And here is a convenient image that shows you your eye, the light direction and the reflection direction and the hemisphere over which we're integrating. Microfacet theory is a way, a more detailed way to explain what goes on with the surface and how it reflects light. The surface can have can have many microfacets and those reflect light according to their own normal. And that's pretty much how roughness works and it ties back into energy conservation, which we'll see in a moment. Here in the picture uh, from the Frostbite engine paper, it shows you on, at the microscopic level that the, the BRD, well, how the BRDF is look, working. So you see the direction of the light and the reflection direction. It also shows you the specular lobe. Energy conservation is very important. Normalizing a uh, lighting function means that the light it reflects must always be between zero and one, meaning that it doesn't reflect more than the light it receives. From this follows that if a surface is rough, it will affect light in many directions and the intensity will be distributed among those directions. And so it will give you a matte look. But if a surface is smooth, the reflection will happen in similar direction. So they will compound and it will give you those bright specular highlights. So the more intense a highlight, the smaller it will be. And the less intensity is, the larger it will be. And it, it does tie up with diffuse. At some point, it's so, it's so rough, it gets diffused and it's reflected in all directions. Other lights would be nice to have because they are more realistic and they are one reason the rendering in Unreal looks very good, but there is no real time support for them in Uni5 and they are more expensive. So it's one thing to consider. All this we talk about, uh, the greater emphasis on theory, is letting us use more physically accurate uh, lighting models, which are also called BRDFs. And they had been published in the past, but people were not using them because we didn't have the calculating power and we didn't have the discipline in the game engines rendering to do it properly physically based. As you can see, there are many moving parts to it, so it takes a lot of work. So we're going to mention briefly later what each of those is good for and what are its defining characteristics. And last but not least, indirect, indirect, indirect lights are very important for a realistic look. One way to approximate them is to use prefiltered cube maps according to the roughness of the material at, a set, at the point we're rendering. So this is another way where roughness helps the realism. The calculation will differ for each BRDF, but it's when you make, uh, when you use custom F BRDFs, that's one thing to worry about. Also global illumination is possible now and you can hook it through those include files I showed you before. Now the physically based process, when you do everything based on physics, there are some things you can do that helps you. So for example, in a normal process, when you don't have reference, something doesn't look like what you meant it to look, but you can only compare it with your expectations. So you don't have any hard um, proof of about what is wrong and small error that you don't really see 
can pile up and then end up being very much wrong. Well, with a physically based process, when you fail, you should have a ray tracing reference and you can compare them and see exactly if it was if it is a problem of real-time approximation, just not having enough computation power for things, or just getting something wrong, which can happen often. Another advantage of it is that once the physically based shading is correct, so once the artists have done their job with the scene, you should be able to change the lighting conditions and it should still look good. They shouldn't have to go back and redo everything because it changed the lights. So it does save a lot of artist time. As I mentioned before, let's have a brief look at a few BRDFs and at what's, what kind of surface they're particularly good at simulating. For example, Umbert, which we used to use uh, even a long time ago. That's the plainest you can have. It's diffuse only, it's very cheap. It's good for matte plastic surfaces. But if you want to use a more realistic um, BRDF or lighting function for diffuse, you should use Orenayer because it adds a roughness model. So it's pretty decent. It's pretty good for skin, clothes, vegetables, even the moon. The moon looks pretty good when you render it with Orenayer. So even if you're not using subsurface scattering, which you could do, but then there are some choices to make. And I'm not really talking about that in this talk. But you still, you still have a pretty good approximation with Oren layer. Then Blin is your basic uh, specular uh, lighting function, which is, it is good with plastic. And if you add an energy conservation, if you make sure it's energy conserving, it looks pretty good. Now, Cryptorance is probably the best uh, lighting function I can use, especially with GGX which is what uh, Unity uses, what Unreal uses. So it's a great specular, it's flexible. You can use it for, to simulate a lot of things. And you can probably approximate any material with it, especially in conjunction with Orion layer, which we just saw. But if you're gonna simulate a metal, it's not as good as Ashkmin Shirley, which is more expensive but it's excellent for metals, it's an isotropic. And also I use it when, you know, when you have a layered surface, so you have some matter surface and then maybe there's water on it or something like that. It's very good to simulate the water on something. And then at the end, we mentioned Disney BRDF. They invented it to use for 3D movies and they optimized it for artists uh, use. So they chose to keep the fewest parameters, they would still pretty much get the job done, so the artist would be less confused about having too many options. It is it is very flexible and it, it is well thought out. Uh, it's probably not as cheap as having a cook turns, but I guess it depends on your optimizations. I think someone, some, some games use it anyway. But um, it's not as flexible since, I mean, it, it says it's doing everything, but it, if you use Atomy Shirley for metal, it will look better than Disney. So that's something to keep in mind. When, and now the bad things, when you choose an unusual uh, BRDF lighting function, you have, to, you, you have to figure out the calculation of the indirect lighting yourself. Now there are some references like, um, are real references for the cook torrents, so you can implement one of those. And there are probably some bits in the Unity CG includes that you can reuse as well, even if you're doing a slightly different version of the same BRDFs like cook torrents. But I find that if you're doing a cook torrents and you need an indirect lighting calculation, you can still use one for a blin and it will look okay. It won't be the best thing ever, but it will be okay. Now, as we mentioned with the Disney BRDF, there are decisions you must take when making new uh, BRDF implementation, and those are artist-facing decisions. The more parameters you have, the more your 
control over the BRDVF is fine-grained and the more realistic your material can be and the more subtle it can be, your rendering. But there is a limit and if you cross that limit when making, letting too many arguments show up in the shader configuration, your artists will, will be confused and they will need some time from you to help them figure out when uh, a, a parameter is, is, is relevant. For example, if you, some parameters will be relevant in different lighting conditions. So you might get rid of one and then find out that you need it after all, because in some other lighting conditions, it's, it's important to be able to tweak that. But that's something you have to figure out when you're there and also based on how much time you can spend with your artists to guide them through the different parameters. Uh, one uh, one very useful thing when you're doing your own custom lighting and in general any shading, any shader code is the Unity Frame Debugger. They didn't use to have that in Unity 4, but it's a very, very helpful tool to have. So with it, you can look at everything that goes on in your frame, every draw call, every mesh, ev all the shader properties. And I wish they had it back in Unity 4 because back then I used the NVIDIA mobile GPU debugger, which was pretty much that good, but it would all, all just work on an NVIDIA GPU, mobile GPU, so that was pretty limited. So we have talked about most things now, so let's take a look at how things actually work in a demo. Here I have heads, <laughs> the, the scanned heads that you can find uh, on the internet, uh, shaded with different shaders. So this is the Unity standard shader. It's got a depth of field uh, effect, which really helps with the realism, by the way. If you have HDR, um, linear, and depth of field, and you have a skin, it will look much, much better. So if we want to see, let's get HDR off. Well, let's look at the shaders then. So here is the standard shader, and here is a Cook Torrance shader with a roughness map. As you can see, they're not terribly different, but they do seem a difference. I think the Cook Tor Plain Cook Torrance one is more realistic than the other one. Also, it's more flexible with the roughness. For example, if you can see here the lines where the roughness changes. Also, I have a, a different example. Here, there is just a triangles, black and white textures. And you can really see the roughness change in there. So that's the magic of roughness. If you have something like um, metal that is also rough in some places, or any reflective surface really, it's quite impressive. So that was... Uh, that was a cocktorrance, and we also have uh, subsurface scattering. You can see here how it all looks a bit more diffuse and more like a skin should do, but this is pretty expensive. Ah, I also wanted to show you yeah, this one. So this is an Ashkmi Shirley, and as you can see, as a metal simulation, it is pretty good. You can tweak the smoothness or the roughness. So that's all for the demo. Now if you have... Ah, actually, let's take a look at what the look tolerance looks like. So we have properties. And the subshader, an Oranea diffuse, that was the one of the Cook Torrance shader, Cook Torrance, 
uh, specula. This is the lighting, the custom lighting function, and this is the surface function. And you can see the this is a custom surface output. So now you should have the basics most of the information you need to start experimenting with your own custom lighting system in Unity. So thank you for listening and you will find slides and references on this post at this URL and we should be done now. See you on Twitter and if you have any questions, I'll now answer to them. Okay, so let's go back to this. Uh, might require some some tweaking of this. So the question is to place the the ad in a row so we can see the difference better. This is the other problem with that. But let's move the camera. It should be okay. So now let's put a let's put a standard one on the main one, and let's put a cook torrents and or an layer on that one. You can see it from the triangles, and then let's put a subsurface cutting on this other one. So um, let's answer the questions then. Mm -hmm. So what ID and or uh, syntax highlighting or cont completion solution I use when I write shaders? I actually use MonoDevelop. Uh, there's not much to help you write shaders, to be honest. And even the bug in the frame debugger I showed you is the best the best to help you. Most of the time you get strange errors. For example, let's let's make some of these fail. Let's break the cook turns. Let's forget and this or something. This is what you get. Uh, magenta shader. And now the, the, the problem here is very easy. So you go to the six six line and then you fix it. But as you can see, there are many, many things that can go wrong in this line art. If you don't want end endlessly lined shaders, you have to do some maths on the same line, and then you have problems that are out of the bug. And there's not much help for it at all. So just MonoDevelop and uh, what MonoDevelop gives you, the frame, the frame debugger in Unity. And you can do some tricks. For example, if you have here, this is the debugging of the depth of field. So this is in three passes. There is a, a pass for the horizontal blur, a pass for the vertical blur, and then I put them together. So if anything goes wrong in this, I can still see if one of the intermediate textures are working. Mm -hmm. Also, something will work a moment and a moment after they won't work, but that's just life. Then, after that, um, if I could talk a bit about how I made the shaders for the VR cooking game and how did they balance the effects with the performance, that was very tricky and went on through all the time, well, the development time, which was pretty long as it was. Um, at the start, it was a search and development project. So we were free, I was free basically to try any BRDFs combination that I wanted. And the only objective was to make it look great and realistic. But um, we could target the latest iPad, which was helpful because they were, that was the iPad Air one, I think, and it was very good compared to the ones before. 
but it, it went on through all the development. So it was, uh, as soon as I had something, I would give it, give it to the artist and they would make some textures and we would talk about what texture we useful for what, because one of the other things with a physically based trader system, the artists are used to make up textures because they look good, but in physically based, you need to make up textures that are actually follows the physically based principle. So you need to have a roughness, which sometimes is also called glossiness, which is confusing. And there are a lot of confusing things to think about and to discuss. So there is a lot of back and forth explaining the artist what you want, also for the artist to find a way to make your shader look good. For example, I chose this model because it's a good model with a good texture, but m many of these shaders without a good model and a good texture, they wouldn't look that much different from a normal shader. So it really needs to be a cooperation of everything. You need to have the linear, you need to have the HDR, you need good artists with which you have to be patient and cooperate extensively. And the performance, since I have control over everything, now there is this annoying sound, I, which you probably are hearing, I'm sorry, but I can't do anything about it. So I was saying, for performance, we had a target machine, and it was actually more powerful than the machine I was using, shader-wise, which was interesting. So I couldn't do anything more complicated than that on my own machine, so I wouldn't do it on the machine that was target. But um, you have the control, so you can switch out uh, a formulation that's more accurate for a formulation that's more approximate and it's cheaper. For example, even in the Unity shaders, um, you can see various approximate. If you look at them, you can see various approximations for different platforms. So you won't have the same exact implementation if you are on mobile compared if you are on PC. So you can tweak by tweaking the approximation. You can tweak how much performance it takes, even though it's still fundamentally the same mathematical formula. So that's also that's one thing you can do, and also you can, uh, well, people use a lot of image effects lately, and I also use image effects, but I try to keep them in as few passes as possible because that's often end up being a lot of the rendering time. So you need to be conservative with that. And try, try, and try, and see what works. Also for the Gear VR version, we had to tone down everything. Everything was baked, every, every lighting was baked except the lighting of the models of the food. And we managed to keep, I think, a subsurface scattering on the prongs, which I was pretty happy with. Even though it's a mobile VR, so we had to have 60 frames a second and it's just, a, a no, it used to be a Note 4 GPU, so it wasn't that powerful. So I think that should cover that. In my opinion, what's the most efficient shader that looks good on low poly models? Uh, as I said, it's hard to make. If the model is low poly, that's okay. But the textures, the roughness textures, the various textures you can use need to be well thought of, well thought about. Before before having a good result, so it, you can probably, I mean, I have another scene here which I didn't think it looked as good, but these are just basically circles. And these are an HDR camera. Let's turn off the rendering color, which usually helps. Why is it open that? Okay. Oh. Anyway, this is, a, as you can see, it's got HDR, it's got uh, linear. I should actually turn off the linear and see the difference it makes. So this is the same shader in gamma and this is the same shader in linear. Also because this particular shader doesn't have those um, 
yeah, it doesn't implement Selenium because I'm relying on Unity. But as you can see, it makes a lot of difference. So my suggestion would be to you make sure you're using linear, make sure you're using HDR, and then we could try, um, let's see, sphere. This one, could try a different material. This looks pretty nice. Cook torrents would probably look good better than Blaine because if you have some if you put some roughness into it, some roughness variation, it will make everything more realistic, even though it's not really even though you don't have as much memory, as much what was that? Polys. So this the the, the texture is slightly disturbing. Let's put this one on, and look, you can see the difference in the roughness. Also, if we change it, it changes quite a lot. It's across. So, it really makes a lot of difference if you use the roughness one and all the other principles I talked to you about. Then, let's see. Um, Do I have any shader programming books that I recommend? Well, they're not that they're not books about this particular topic. I mean, there are books, the reference shader books, which are OpenGL references, something like that. There are the GPU Pro books, which are good but won't give you the basics. There isn't. I don't think there's any intermediate book that's recent and really explains this stuff. There is the book of shaders that I know of, but it still does. It's more about effects shaders and interesting stuff you can do with shaders. That's not lighting, so that's not quite the same thing. Well, GPU Pros and also DCG book, which is free online. It covers a lot of the a lot of the basics you need, and then I'll publish some articles on shader cut, I guess, as well. How oh, is the performance of these shaders on Intel laptop GPUs? Actually, I'm running this on uh, MacBook Air. So as you can see, the, it's not too bad. It's not, I mean, I used to run these things on an iPad um, Air 1 GPU. So that was way less powerful than this, I would think. Now, there is a lot of computational power in modern days GPUs. That's why people are talking about implementing ray tracing these and the ray traced shadows, ray traced reflections, because we have all this power. So I think you can use the things I showed you pretty much freely and always check. You still have to check if you would work on a lower um, uh, level platform, but I think they should still work without any hitches. And then it's specific problems that you can have, and those are hard to get into just from the general principle. Uh, simple optimization techniques for VR. I probably turn off my slides. If you can see. Hello there. So, simple optimization techniques for VR. Basically, you have to batch everything. Anything that's not moving has to be batched has to be light mapped. It's preferably not even light map, but just unlit using an unlit shader and you will need to have a texture that you can render. I know some people rendered it using Maya. They will render the whole lighting using Maya and then apply the texture. And then you can concentrate what the, the calculation power on the stuff that actually moves. So it needs a real time uh, component. It needs to be in real time. But this is for uh, Gear VR, this specific Gear VR, because in Gear VR you can't really move your head as much. So you wouldn't, the stuff that doesn't move, you wouldn't see many differences, whether it's baked or not. On normal VR, it still applies. Well, use as many, as I said, that and then 
you have to keep in mind that it's rendering the same thing twice. But it's still the same things that you do for no VR things. The problem is with VR, you really need to keep the framework stable, the, the FPS tables, the FPS stable. So you need to not cause anything to change from one frame to the other. And then, uh, are there any, any Unity plugins I would recommend to create good shaders easily? Did I try Shader Forge, for example? I didn't because I prefer to write my shaders in code because then I know what they are doing and I know what performance they will have and I know where to touch them where when I want that performance to get better. But I know artists which use Shader Forge and are pretty happy. I think you could still could use from someone taking a look at it and the end and optimizing it, which you should always do that. But yeah, Shader Forge seems to be the one preferred by the artists. So I, I would try that. Uh, are the default shaders provided with Unity, which I could start to edit, modify, going from the scratch seems hard to me. It is very hard and you don't need to do that. As I said, there is a, a URL you can, wait, let's see if I can get this to show a URL. Um, Unity something, something. Three D get unity. All the versions. Built in shaders, and that will give you um these. These are this. Oh, sorry, you're not seeing that. There. This is G includes, as you can see, there are a lot of them. You see here, global illumination, lighting common, PBS lighting. These are all things you can use in, in Unity to make your own shaders, and I would really suggest you use those. Oh. Yes, this is in full screen. It's a bit of a problem too. Okay, should do it. So, for example, if you look at these, it's not very easy to read, but you can get everything that Unity is using. For example, this is the standard lighting function for the standard shader. This is the third one, because you can do the third in Unity. And this is some standard GI, so you'd have to study all these files and figure out things one by one. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'll write an article on Shader Cut, but this is a huge, huge, I mean, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of writing on this. I can't show it in a few minutes. But yeah, you don't have to start from scratch. Absolutely not. Any Shader Tips for WebGL? Uh, actually, I haven't used WebGL with Unity much. Not with Unity at least, I've used WebGL alone, but I'm afraid I can't help you with the Unity aspect of it. Uh, the alarm sound was someone in the neighborhood. Okay, um, GPU skinning and HDR settings, okay. So HDR settings, as you could, there's not much of a setting because it just just this. This is it. The one the thing we can play with they are the tone mapping. Now on this one I actually don't have any tone mapping because even if you don't have any tone mapping, I think Unity will automatically clip those values to integers and they will still show. But yeah, doing tone map do, using tone mapping is doing it right. And I suggest you look at in the slides of that website I, I showed because there's a lot of information of it on that, and I probably post something about it on ShaderCut as well. Um, tool settings, GPU skinnings. Now, GPU skinning is a bit dangerous, and it can be faster, but it can also be slower depending on the platform. 
And the last time I used it, it had some big problems, but that was a while ago. So I guess you just try and see. It could be any, it could cause anything. It could interact with your platform so as to break your joints in your skinning, which is what happened to me when I was doing that. It's a bit risky, but you have to, you have to test it and uh, measure with the frame debugger uh, and also the profile. Uh, yeah, I guess more the profile than the frame debugger. So I suggest you try it on your specific platform, which is, uh, I don't know if you're targeting PC, but if you're targeting mobile, there's another difficulty to that because you need, you need to have the profiling for the GPU needs to be done on the specific GPU, which unit doesn't always spot. Okay, it's try and see, and don't trust it ever. In Cybercook, do we use any optimization after compilation process? Um, not really. No, I don't think we did. Not for shaders, at least. Actually, for shaders, there was the very annoying side effects. We had a lot of shaders, and they all needed to be compilated at the start time of the app because that's how OpenGL works. And it's, that's going to change with Spirvu and Vulkan. They're going to be some of the of that is going to be made pre-compiled, and some of that is going to be compiled, but it should get better. Also, what do you mean about optimization? Just uh, compile optimization. Or what? If you if you answer to that, I'll get back to it. Spear. Yeah, well, my pronunciation might be wrong. But... Spear and Vulcan. They were a lot talked about at GDC, and I think Vulcan has got at least five hours of video where they are. Yeah, where's my website? I'm not sure if I can find it now, but uh, Vulcan. This is the future, but it's going to take a while to get here. So, and also, Unity will probably implement most of that for you anyway. So, it was this and uh, about five hours of video you can have fun with. Um, so. Any other out we can get from Unity Store in terms of shaders besides Shader Forge for PBS? So, I haven't used any, but I'm sure there are. I mean, I've seen other shader systems before Unity made their standard shader because after that, I guess people weren't as, is as interested, but I think there was a shader system called Lux, and they used to be Marmoset, but I'm not sure they still up update those because, yeah, with the standard shader being okay, then the demand must have died down a little bit, but I haven't looked up recently. I, I prefer to make mine up if I can. Um, shader Forge is good. It probably supports PBS. I don't know. I haven't used it, but I think it does. Well, you can find textures, you can find uh, Substance Painter and Substance Designer, which I think would be helpful, but then it depends on what you want to do with it because you, you won't get to touch the code, but you would have same defaults and you can tweak them. And the same thing you see in the, in the Substance Designer should look the same in Unity or pretty similar. So that could be helpful. Yeah, I would be willing to share my shaders uh, over time because I need to clean them up a bit. Also, I'll do that over time on Shader Cut. Maybe the one from today, I'll just others share it. I'll put it on Shader Cut. And because it's one file, so I guess I can explain it pretty easily. Um, no, I'm not sure if we still have time, but with VR, can you point me to any good resources, especially mobile VR? Well, um, I've done uh, Gear VR, and I know of a few posts 
one even on the Unity website that were about optimizations, but I would have to look for them, to be honest. I can I don't have them off, off right at this moment. I can look for them and then I can, if the chat is still open, I'll post them there. But I don't know what especially you're interested in, but mobile VR is basically about keeping everything fast and very, very lean and not making people sick. Now the comp computational power to render a scene twice with a frame rate that needs to be at least 60 frames per second, it's, it can't make much with that as you can see from the stuff that's getting out, uh, even when it works very well, it doesn't have amazing graphics. It has got good style usually, that you have to compensate for the lack of computational power with style. Then maybe physically based is a bit uh, too much if we talk about the Gear VR case. Though it should get better because they're getting new phones out and they should be more powerful. I'm talking about um, Note 4 especially, but the new ones, the S6 is more powerful, so that should benefit a bit more for it. But as I said before, just try to bake everything you can and keep as as few draw, draw calls as you can. Really pay attention, really drill down into the frame debugger and check that your draw calls are not getting out of hand. Uh, about after compilation optimization, I mean that you open shader assembly and do something with compile shader for increased performance. No, I don't do that because then it's a problem to, well, it, it would be too time consuming. I didn't have that much time and it was just me doing the shaders. So I couldn't, did, really didn't have the time to do that. Also, every time it compiles, it will be overwritten, I guess. I would have to think about it, but that may, may happen. So no, I haven't really explored that. Um, okay, that seems to be all. And we are probably a bit over time anyway. <laughs> So thank you very much, everyone. And it's been a pleasure. And if I can turn this off. OK. And see you around. Thank you. I'll end the conference now, if that's OK. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. OK. okay.